Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We appreciate your interest and the time that you're sharing with us as we use the internet, study the Word of God together. We've been doing this since 2012. We enjoy so much. All of us, uh, you know, the, the preachers who are on this panel, we enjoy our studying together. But we also appreciate you being with us. And so if you have any questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. If you're viewing this on our YouTube channel, then use the chat area. Drop, let us hear your thoughts as we continue through our study of John. If you have any questions, drop them there as well. If you're viewing us on our Facebook page, then just use the comment area that's connected with this live video feed. You can also send us email, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com, or you can email us individually there. You'll see the first name, short version of it at truthfactor.com, a little bit different than the questions one, but you can email us individually there if you have a specific question about something that was said during the course of our study. So let's go ahead and bring everyone in. We have a question this morning that was sent to us from Lori. It's a simple one, so I didn't give you any prep work whatsoever. Um, but just real, real quick, we'll deal with it. I think it's an interesting question. She says, can you explain to me what the difference is between a gospel, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the books of the Bible? Now, we, we use the term book of the Bible as a very generalized term, okay? Because really, the Bible is made up of a collection, collection of writings. Um, I don't know if they would have used the term book so much, you know, Moses, here's the first five books, you know, you know, but they would have been the writings, but we call books just to identify them. Um, we would say there's 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, throw it to your favorite tune and you've got a nice little kid song and everything. But when you're in the New Testament, you're actually seeing a collections of collection of writings that are comprised of the first four books we call the Gospels, and then the rest of it up to Revelation, and Revelation could be, uh, maybe still considered this, are basically epistles. Well, with exception of Acts, sorry about that, start in Romans. The rest of them are letters that were written. And I included the, 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 uh, 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 the uh, Book of Prophecy, Revelation, in that because it's addressed to seven uh, churches there of Asia. Same thing for the Old Testament, you know. So. The Gospels are books of the Bible, just as we would call Romans a book of the Bible or Second Chronicles a book of the Bible. It's just um, just another inspired writing, men moved by the Holy Spirit to record the will of God, the history of God, the desires of God for man. Uh, does anyone want to add to that? We might consider the fact that there aren't four Gospels. Uh, there is one Gospel. And maybe you said that, That's and I missed point. it. Uh, but th th there's not there's not four gospels. There are four gospel accounts uh, of the it. life life of Christ. But uh, and I, I wasn't uh, I was distracted. So if I missed that you said that, I apologize. No, no, but, that's that's a good clarification. Okay. Yeah, that is more evangelical approaching it from four different yeah. perspectives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will say they were each gospel was written to a different audience. That's, uh, In each account. Uh, to a degree, yeah. to a degree, yeah. And, and to that end, um, we, we see that the gospel message has not changed from when Jesus first gave it. It has not. But it's interesting that these four pictures, these four counts, um, they're preserved for us by God, and they're really preachers doing what preachers have always done. We are taking the gospel message and presenting it in such a way that's best suited to the person we're teaching. And you see that with Matthew, there's an emphasis on the um, uh, the lineage or the continuity between the, the Messiah, the yeah, the Messiah, the King that's been promised. You see, Mark's Gospel is the shortest, but it focuses on action because it's written towards Romans who are very American-like in their attention span. Um, also, Mark emphasizes more than just per uh, per capita, if you want to use that term, the last week of Christ. Matthew emphasizes the main sermons of Christ. Luke emphasizes the the parables and a chronological approach to Christ's life. Um, and then John just outright just says, my goal is not to give a a play-by-play -play of Christ's life, but I'm going to show you what Christ did in his life to show that he was the Son of God. And so for us today, I just want to make the, a truth-factoring moment, uh, you know, 
H, I wouldn't take Matthew and teach it to every putt buddy I'm te- studying with. I, I select the gospel I'm studying with people based on their needs are at. Uh, when I do a community Bible study, which tends to be a little bit more surface level introduction to the Bible, I always use Mark. It's the shortest, it's the simplest to understand. Um, if there's somebody that's struggling with faith in God, or maybe they're not convinced Jesus is God, I go straight to John. Uh, John has been the favorite for centuries for that. Uh, they're just different tools that we have in our evangelist toolbox to help teach people. So, yeah. And uh, I'll just tell you that here uh, in Ellettsville, Indiana, uh, over the past several years, I have taught uh, all four of those books in adult Bible classes. <clears throat> Pardon me. All four of those books in adult Bible classes. And I've tried not to do a harmony of the gospel accounts, but rather uh, take each one for what it says. Uh, and now there are exceptions you know, where we go and we say, here are some details that are filled in that may help us to understand this in, in other places, but not a, uh, here's three chapters where this particular event is discussed, you know, in the different accounts. But, and I think that's, I think has been beneficial just to see from each of the men's uh, who wrote from their perspective uh, those truths. And and going back real quick to the, the question, explain the difference and stuff. I, I heard one time, I this has been helpful for me. I heard a preacher one time say, if you want to take your copy of the Divine Library, um, and this is really what we're holding. It's it's We call it books. They're letters, they're histories, they're laws, they're poetry, they're, they're prophecy. Um, you know, it's just the divisions we have in our English Bibles. For example, the Jews, uh, a lot of our books that we divide, the Jews don't divide them. You know, it's not First and Second Chronicles. It's it's la- it's later Kings, uh, if I remember correctly. It's not First and Second Kings. It's er- former Kings, and you know, the twelve minor prophets, uh, we have them separated. Well, for the Jewish canon, it's just the later prophets. It's one one solid thing. And so it's just the way we have divided to help us better understand and better study the word of God. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, One interesting uh, footnote on what Paul was saying, as far as sometimes you'll want to compare stories in the Bible and the, in the gospels. Um, So Sunday, we're going to be covering Matthew 17 Sunday night. And we're going to be looking at the transfiguration. What's interesting is Luke throws interesting interesting detail to that account that Mark and Matthew omit. And that is Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his departure or his decease. Whereas the other two, you kind of wonder, well, what were they talking about? Well, Luke tells us effectively what they were talking to Jesus about. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you have any other questions, be sure to send them to us. As we mentioned a while ago, you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or if they are you know, really pertaining to our current study, drop them in the comment area as well as the chat area. And um, we will we will bring them into our study. You know, before we before we begin mm-hmm. on the transfiguration, I wondered for a short while, how did Peter, James, and John know that this was Elijah and Moses? They didn't have pictures of them. But uh, probably picked it up in in the discussion, <laughs> from the discussion. It's, yeah, especially if if they could hear what was going, what was being said, and we assume that that they did. Okay, then if there was direct reference to who they were by Jesus, you know, um, could be a number of ways. Probably the simplest answer is the Holy Spirit told them too, but it could be. Yeah, yeah, um, but that's a good point. Not having pictures is yeah. All right, so speaking of pictures, John paints a beautiful picture of the deity of Christ. How's that for a segue? We yeah. left off <laughs> we left off last week. Um, we had we had uh, in our study we've made it from John chapter one, verse one down to about verse thirty four. Not all in one week. That took us about three weeks. I think this is our fourth week now in the Gospel of John. And we have the introduction of Jesus being the Word. We have uh, the introduction of John as being the one who, who, who um, prepared the way for the coming of the word of Christ. We do have John's personal, um, serving as a personal witness to having heard God himself declare 
that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah in whom this is my beloved son in whom I have well pleased here him. And John says, I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. So we're going to pick up here in just a moment will be John, um, sending two of his disciples to Jesus and he uh, identifies who Jesus is to those disciples. And this is really relevant in the course of John's gospel as to who regarding who Jesus truly was. Any thoughts on that before we jump to our reading? Okay, let's see. I've got any, many, many, mo. Who's going to read today? I'm not sure. So let's go. Um, Brandon, let's go ahead. No, Paul. I'm so sorry, Brandon. We're going to sh shove you aside for a moment. Paul's missed so much. So we're going to let Paul read. I mean, we, we are the same person. So <laughs> yeah, you okay. had the name right the first time. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Paul, if you will, let's start reading in John chapter one, verse 35. And, um, let's, let's go ahead and read down through verse 42. We'll find a, a little, use that as a breaking point. What translation will you be re, uh, reading from? I can go with most translations. I've got the new King James pulled up. Okay. That's what I have up as well. So let's okay. go ahead and get this switched over. And whenever you are ready. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he shall excuse me, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. All righty. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Paul. <clears throat> so let's go back there then for just a moment. My Bible program has been a little finicky on me right now. Let's go back there to Sorry, verse number. I stumbled over the words for just a little bit there, but oh, hopefully it came, came through all right. You are okay. So we have uh, John standing with two of his disciples, and he makes a declaration about Jesus. Paul, do you have any thoughts about what he says regarding who Jesus was? Well, I do. Uh, now, and we can talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Uh, the Passover lamb, uh, the one that was sacrificed for uh, our forgiveness, the one we remember and, and all of that. But something that I found very interesting, I think there's a great lesson uh, for us as preachers and uh, as those who would try to help others, is that when John speaks of Jesus, people follow Jesus. Uh, they don't follow, they don't continue following Jesus. John, uh, in, in at least at that moment. Uh, we read there that he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Uh, you see, this is so also typical, not to wander too far away, but is so uh, typical of Paul's work, is that Paul never sought to have disciples after himself, but rather when he taught them the gospel, when he taught people the word of God, they followed Jesus. And I think here is a, a great lesson for us, is that when we tell people, I want to talk to you about the Lamb of God, they don't all of a sudden become followers of Paul Adams and, and his teachings. They become followers of Jesus. That's a good, good explanation. Go ahead, Bob. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking... The next day doesn't mean the next day after his baptism. 
But the next day after John is talking about Jesus' baptism, because according to Matthew, mm -hmm. Mark, after his baptism, he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So this is probably sometime later after his, uh, after his baptism. John mentions his baptism, or at least John the Apostle refers to John the Baptist referring to the baptism. And so it's told not in the, not by the author himself, but he allows someone else, John the Baptist, to tell about the baptism. And this is after that day uh, that he's standing with these two disciples, one of whom is Andrew. The other is probably John himself. Of course, we know that he never names himself in the whole, uh, in the whole book. Uh, but uh, it is supposed that the other disciple was John, and that of, out of humility, he simply does not identify himself. And, so, and, and also, to me, the Lamb of God would sound so strange to people. Well, why is God offering a Lamb? He does, he's never sinned. And, and so, uh, he's offering the Lamb on our behalf, not on his own behalf. Certainly, he doesn't have to. Uh, but no man can find a lamb on the planet Earth that would do what the blood of Jesus Christ would do. Uh, no animal could do that. And so God himself provides uh, his son as the lamb for the uh, forgiveness of sins. Okay. That's a good point. Good point. Um, you know, kind of, kind of scrolling back here real quick, Bob, as you were talking about that, it is interesting that when you go back to verse 19, and I'll just bear with me, I'm going to scroll through. So if you get motion sickness, look away here in a second. But there in verse number 19, we start section. Now, this is a testimony of John and when the Jews sent priests, Levites to him. So it goes through, talks about, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And he talks about, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. We talked about that. 28, these things were done in Beth of Barbara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Then in verse 29, here he says, the next day, all right, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And Bob, this is what you're talking about. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then he has this discussion here, relays back to the baptism of Jesus where John saw for certain who he was. And then we have again the next day, John stood with two of the disciples. So I don't know, you know, going back to what you're talking about, it's, it's kind of hard to, to put down a specific point as to what days, but the way John kind of, you have one conversation where he identifies Jesus as the lamb, and then you have another conversation where he does it again. But this time to get his disciples, the first time was an answer to the Pharisees who came out to find out who he was, Right, I believe. And then this time it's in the presence of his two disciples there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Quick question we have that has developed in the, the, the chat room. Y'all be thinking about if you, if what else we want to talk about in regards to, um, um, what well, we're looking at here, a few more things to point out. This first one has to do with reference Caleb in reference to the idea that the two disciples heard him speak and they followed him. Uh, Caleb says that Acts 19, you see the same thing when they hear about Jesus, they follow him. Okay. But then David Clark says, I noticed that Jesus was called several names. How many names in the Bibles was he called? Anyone have that just real handy dandy in a nice list reference somewhere? Um, uh, I don't, um, uh, <laughs> somewhere I probably have it here, but you know, I think it's interesting. His, uh, his favorite self-reference seems to be son of man. I think he uses that more than anything else himself and only two others. I think, uh, Stephen is one of them. And, and, uh, I forget the other one refers to Jesus as the mm -hmm. son of man. Okay. Uh, but Jesus more often than not identifies himself as the son of man, uh, yeah. because yeah. he's the son of a man, but because he, he is in part a prophet, uh, a, a, uh, a representative of the human, uh, a product of the, uh, of the human race in that he came from a woman. Uh, but more than that, and more importantly, he is the son of God, uh, born of a woman, but also rabbi, priest, priest, prophet. Yeah. It, 
and in John's gospel, he'll refer to himself as the good shepherd, the bread of life. Um, he, depending on your reading on his exchange with Pilate, he will use the same emphatic I am as uh, Yahweh does in the Old Testament Exodus. Um, you know, this might be a good future study because I, I have some notes. I can't, I don't have access to it right now, but there's several times Jesus quotes Old Testament scripture using the covenant name of God, but referring to himself. So I think it's very interesting that, you know, there's definitely, there's a lot used. And then based on some passages later in the general epistles, there's some passages in the Old Testament, like the rock that they all drank from and, and the Exodus is Christ. So there's, there's a lot there more than just, um, uh, what we're talking about right now, but I think the important thing to emphasize when we come across it's not the, it's not necessarily the number of the titles, the number of the names given. It's what do those names uh, reveal? And I, I don't. It's my opinion that God doesn't just give names for giving names. He gives descriptors. He gives uh, uh, titles, if you will, that reveal something. So as Bob pointed out, the Son of Man kind of conveys uh, Jesus' humanity. Uh, his role as prophet, uh, the the Lamb of God, as we've been talking about here, indicates to his his coming sacrifice. So, it, when you come across those titles, when you come across those names, really ask yourself, okay, what what is God teaching me here through this descriptor of Christ? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, if you do a search, um, Google search, that's not go search. Uh, there's a couple of articles that come up with fifty names and titles. So you know. But there's a kind of distinction there. That kind of answers yeah. what David asks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that Jesus was called several names, but some of the things that y'all were talking about is how Jesus referred to himself. Yeah. And then yeah. I think there can be a distinction between the two, you know, post gospel records, you know, how, how the apostles would refer to him. Um, but, you know, I can't, when you talk about son of man, you got to think about Daniel seven as well. Yeah. In regards to the prophecy and him fulfilling that. But. And it, it, God addresses Ezekiel as the son of man. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's a, a type, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's Good thing, question. I think I pointed this out last week. Uh, John has to explain these uh, Jewish words and festivals. Uh, rabbi, which is to say, uh, which is to say when translated teacher, that is the Apostle John explaining that, not John the Baptist uh, explaining yeah. that in medical expression. And same thing when he gets down to Cephas, which is translated a stone. This is John the Apostle pointing out to his readers who are, as you pointed out, most likely Romans. And uh, after, uh, much later than the uh, other Gospels, other accounts of the Gospel. Uh, but... Uh, that's interesting to me uh, yeah. that he explained those. Okay. All right. So let's see. So now let's walk kind of walk through real quick the remainder of the section here. So we have the two disciples. They follow Jesus, and he he says to them, "What do you seek?" They identify. They call him Rabbi, which, as the text tells us, means teacher. And they ask him interesting question: "Where are you staying?" So Jesus says, "Come and see." And they went with him. And it's interesting that John makes a statement here that they that it was about the tenth hour of the day. What what time would that be in that time? Four p.m. I'm thinking. Four. Okay. About four p.m. We 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 we'd call it afternoon we for from, us. We would start from six a.m. It's the it's the the twelve hour day, not the twenty four mm -hmm. hour. Yeah, that'd be right then. Yeah, going from six to four. Yeah. Um, and then he makes the point here that, um, one of the two who heard John, who did we say that was, who does the text say? One of the hey, two disciples, Andrew. Yeah. Andrew, who's Simon Peter's brother. You know, Andrew doesn't get a lot of screen time Yeah. in the biblical text. Uh, Peter's really the one that, that does. Um, and I but what's, in John is about the only, the apostle John is about the only one that that gives any attention to Andrew. Yeah. Later, that's good Philip, uh, when some, some Greeks come to Philip, Philip takes them to Andrew, and Andrew says, let's go and talk to Jesus. Yeah. 
But you think well, about this. What's kind of interesting. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, what's interesting is in the the Gospel of John tends to be the most variety of apostles in general. Um, it's not just uh, Andrew getting more, I like that term, screen time. Thomas does uh, in chapter 20, or uh, Philip does uh, in chapter 14. Or It's kind of interesting that uh, John, whereas the other Gospels kind of focus on the big four, the big three, uh, more often, John actually is very spread out with the apostles and talks about a lot of them. Okay, good point, good point. It's also interesting that how quickly, how quickly this Andrew learns and identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ. Yeah. I think that's a good point. If it weren't for Andrews, there wouldn't be any Peters in the, in the church. Uh, because yeah. he, he, he brought on and probably indicating that he was the older of the two brothers. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, and John, um, on, go ahead, on this section from about 35 to the end of the chapter, it's my favorite text to preach on when it comes to personal work. Uh, because I think the mistake we've we've made is we we emphasize gimmicks, pre-can studies, converting them in one study, that kind of stuff. And that can happen, don't get me wrong. But you see a biblical model here how personal work is done. And Nolan's really doing a study they're saying hey you should come and check out jesus even when he gets some pushback like can anything good come out of nazareth like well, why don't you come and test it now the application for us today is we don't have the flesh and blood of christ with us but all we're dealing when we teach people is all we're saying is you come and see christ you test christ if he is found trustworthy and reliable and stands the test then you should believe in him um, and it starts off with their neighbors and their relatives, not, not random people on the street, not cold calling, not mailers. It starts at home. Um, and honestly, that can be the toughest people to convert, but that's where we see in the Bible. It starts at least. Yeah. So, well, now this, this is a rabbit trail that could take us into the methodology of personal work. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna try not to go that far, far down it, but if you look, look down at just, just a little bit there, you kind of compare the difference between, well, let's prepare a nice handy outline that walks someone through everything versus let's sit down with the gospel. It may take longer to get to the key, what they need to learn, but which one solidifies the teaching more or maybe a combination of both. And the, I I don't say it's either and. I think each person has to figure out what methodology, if you want to use that term, works best for them. For me, it has been expository. It has been book studies. I rather take somebody through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm, I don't do an exhaustive study. I'm a firm believer that God knew what he was doing when he inspired the text, and so I keep a two to three chapter a week pace. Mm -hmm. And I, all I do is I just keep pointing. Here's what Jesus is doing. Here's what Jesus is showing. Here's his authority. Here's this, what this is doing. And Mark's gospel, because it's one I use the most, naturally concludes with an invitation like, okay, here's what Jesus said to be saved. Are you, do you want to do that? Um, yeah. You know, and normally if they don't, but they still want to study, I go into Acts and then it's like every other chapter we're talking about conversion. And so we're, we're, you know, we're hitting that over and over and over again. Now, there have been times where it seems that maybe I do need to do a, a, a topical a study to kind of maybe maybe summarize, connect all the points we've been talking about so they can clearly see it, but I don't I don't jump straight into a topical one. And that's just because I don't like the position it puts people in where if I'm flipping all over my Bible and they don't know the Bible really well, they have to put more trust in me and that I'm handling this accurately than they are in the text. I have nothing wrong with the topical study. That that can work. I was converted through topical studies. Personally, I don't like I don't like the feeling I get when I'm when I'm doing that with people. Now, if they know their Bible a little bit better, I have no problem. But if I'm dealing with a complete newbie, which I often do. I rather start with Mark one or Matthew one, and let's just just walk through it so they can see everything in context. 
and they can see what's going on there. Um, long answer to a short question, but I think everybody's got to experiment, try different ways, and find what works best for you. It's a good point. You got to know your audience. Yeah. And at Forest Hills, we you know we've got people at different levels of knowledge and understanding. I try not to dumb it down too much, but I do want to reach the person with the least knowledge and help them to understand it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one side comment this is completely off topic, but Brian, you've really cleaned yourself up today. The last couple of weeks, your head's been a little fuzzy, just, just a little bit out of focus and you're looking sharp today. I think you buffed that head up a little. We bit. know somebody. I I I both look sharp and am sharp. Is how I like to say it. Um, also, I got a new camera, so that there you go. <laughs> I thought that was the case. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, Tom, uh, John, I had a quick yeah. comment I wanted to throw out there. Sure. Uh, one of the things we just read that I think is really interesting um, is that John is telling us that the first time Peter meets Jesus is when Peter gets the nickname Peter. Which of course we know Cephas, Peter, the rock, uh, you know, the uh, our Bible say the stone to give us that sense of it. Now, and that's that is to say that in Matthew 16, uh, when Peter makes that confession, that is not the time when he gets that name. That's kind of important. Something I share sometimes if I'm visiting with someone who's Catholic, and and they say, you know, Peter made the great confession, and then Jesus gave him that name. Jesus giving him that name wasn't because of the great confession. And what we're about to find out is that Peter wasn't the first person to make the confession. We're about to find out the first person to make the confession is the Apostle Nathaniel. We haven't got there yet, but we're going to get there here in a few verses. So I, I like to take these two statements here in John chapter 1 and uh, kind of push them towards the idea that, you know, the moment Jesus met Simon, he says, well, I'm going to call you Peter, you know, you're because you're a stone, you're a rock, um, you know, and, and, then, and then later somebody else will be the first one to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Good point. Very good point. Well, and and even to that, I know we're not doing Matthew, but I'd like to point out Matthew too that Jesus used two different words there, and the word Cephas it, it's a, it's a it's a stone you can pick up, and yet the rock Jesus built his church on it's bedrock. You you can't pick it up; it's immovable. And so there's kind of that play on words there too, where it's Peter is yeah he's he's a rock, but he's movable. He he can go with the wind, as we see in the book of Acts and Galatians, but um, which kind of refutes the idea that, oh, being the first pope, you know, he spoke for God and was in, infallible, that kind of stuff. Like, no, that's that's not what he's saying there. So. You know, I pointed this out last night in, in our study uh, in Acts chapter 8. The apostles sent Peter and John. What does that say about Peter? He was not the eminent apostle. He was one of 12. Yeah. And the body was had the authority over the over the individuals. The body of apostles had the authority over individual apostles. Good point. Good point. Okay. All right. Well, let's then go ahead and again, if you've oh, I forgot to do the YouTube subscribe. We'll drop it in Paul's area since Paul's not on camera right now. <laughs> Be sure to if you're watching us on a YouTube channel to subscribe. Like the video if you would, subscribe to the channel so you receive future notifications of when we go live or if we were to drop our just video separate from our live stream, um, you'll get notifications there. Or if you are over on the Facebook side of things. There we go, wrong button. If you're on the Facebook side of things and you can like and follow us there on Facebook. Receive notifications as well. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go ahead, Brendan, and have you, if you would, sir, to read, picking up in verse 43. We talked about, a while ago, introduced um, the coming in of Nathaniel. Let's start in verse 46, and let's read down through, let's go and read down through the end of the chapter. We're ready for 43. Pardon? We only read through 42 before. Yeah, we're going to start at 43. Okay, I thought you said start at 46. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, heard, so I'm, I may have. <laughs> um, but so, Brendan, if you would start 43, let's go ahead and take this to the end of the chapter. What translation will be you be using? Uh, New King James. It's just okay. easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. so. All right. All right. Take him in verse 43. The following day, 
Jesus waited to go to Galilee. Uh, wanted, excuse me. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from uh, Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right. All right. So let's back up there to number verse number 43 in this. A lot of interesting thoughts as we're kind of reading through this. Just kind of came to mind. Think about how well did Philip know Nathaniel? Think about why would he go to him? Um, I would assume they had some sort of prior knowledge of each other instead of just some random stranger along the way, but that's not super relevant here. Let's start back at verse 43. Um, going back to there, Jesus, uh, Brendan, he goes to Galilee and he finds Philip there. And it's one of those classic cases we studied about, isn't it? Where Jesus says, follow me to Peter. I'll make you fishers of men. You'll follow me. And he does. But any, any thoughts about that? Well, it's when you, when, when we boil down the gospel call, when we boil down the offer of salvation, it really comes down to these two words, follow me. Um, and it requires the same kind of decision and commitment that these all were willing to make an immediate decision. When you understand what that means and a forsaking of all else to follow Christ, um, those really are the requirements. Now, yes, we'll we'll talk about what are the conditions of salvation, what does the Bible teach, but when we get to the base level, this is what it's about. Jesus says, follow me. That invitation's still there. Are we willing to do that? A, a second point here, just the, on Nathaniel himself, um, I think this is a good reminder that sometimes it's the most unlikely of converts in our estimation that end up being some of the most ardent and fervent believers. Um you know, it, it's the unexpected person. It's the person who we think there's no chance you're going to obey the gospel, that they end up growing and maturing and becoming great pillars in the church and great Christians. And so it's a reminder of don't judge a book by its cover and don't write anybody off. If somebody's willing to sit down and, and talk and, and study, um, there's a chance. And there's always a chance you 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 have no idea they could be the next apostle paul except the apostleship you know they could be the next great preacher or or, or evangelist for the church um but you don't we'll never get to see that unless people are willing to take the chances and sit down with people and talk with people you know talking okay. about Nathan john is the only the apostle john is the only author who does not mention bartholomew and the only one who does mention nathaniel so many have thought that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. Bartholomew being a patronymic, Bar, son of uh, uh, Thomas, or whatever his father's name would have been. And if that is the case, in the three lists from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Philip and Bartholomew are always in the same group of four. There are three groups of four in the three four lists of the apostles, counting Acts 1. And, uh, and, and they're in different orders, but, uh, each, each group stays together in each of those lists and Philip and Bartholomew are always in that same fourth, that same, uh, third, I guess you could say same group of four. And so if that's the case, then Philip probably was real close to Nathaniel, uh, or Bartholomew if he, if he is the same one, which would be explain why he would go to him before he might go to someone else. That's good clarification there. Yeah. 
basically Bartholomew and Nathaniel would be the same person, potentially. That's yeah. thought by many. Some some dispute it, but yeah, yeah. Um, I tell you what does impress me about the text here, just looking at what it says, or more about Philip. So Philip, in just this short time, all right, at least John's record here. Okay, so short time with Jesus. We see him drawing a conclusion that, and if he's one of the disciples of John, tells us he had a knowledge, maybe already present, about what the Old Testament law and prophets prophesied. Here's why I say this. He says, Philip found Nathaniel said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he, he specifically had enough knowledge there, had knowledge about the Old Testament, as we would call it, to know that Moses and the law and the prophets, think about Elijah there, who they foretold in the, regarding the coming of the Messiah, that he put that together real quick. We're assuming real quick that Jesus of Nazareth is that Messiah there. Interestingly, that those who sent uh, people to question John the Baptist, they did not seem to understand that. They seemed to think that these were separate individuals in these various uh, parts of the Old Testament. Uh, the prophet, uh, of course, the prophet and Elijah were two different persons, but they didn't understand that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that does show a lot of uh, uh, a lot of good about uh, Philip's uh, understanding of the Old Testament. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. All right. And then we had Nathaniel saying, "Can anything good come out of Nazareth?" And so Philip says, "Come and see." Um. But what do you think? How do you think Nathaniel responded? Let's call him Bartholomew too. How do you think he responded? Not responded. What was he thinking when Jesus says, behold, an Israelite, indeed, whom is no deceit? Or guile, depending on the translation there. And then Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And then Jesus says, basically, I saw you before you saw me. I heard you before you heard me. Yeah. That was powerful. John, um, John I had a quick comment, uh, if it's yeah. okay, about yeah, uh, this ahead. statement, can anything good... Can anything good account him out of Nazareth? I'm not sure I always understood that passage. At first I thought, well, he just doesn't like Nazareth. Um, but but as I, I study a little more in John, I realize one of the big debates in the book of John is where is Jesus from? Uh, in chapter 7, they're going to be really upset. They're going to say, you know, the Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem, but Jesus comes from Nazareth, so he can't be the Messiah. What's neat, by the way, is that John never answers that question for us. He kind of expects that we've read Matthew and Luke, and we know where Jesus was actually born. Um, so John never, ever says, you know, he really was from Bethlehem. Uh, and that's that's kind of a neat testimony that you have to have all the, uh, the gospel accounts in order to understand them. But the other thing I think is important is that they'll point this out. You know, we really don't have a concept of a prophet that comes from Nazareth. Now, I'm going to be careful to say Matthew tells us, you know, there was the light was to come from Galilee. But I think that's what Nathaniel is saying. He's saying, yeah, you know, how can he be the Christ if he's from Nazareth? Because the Christ doesn't come from Nazareth. The Christ comes from Bethlehem. Um, and I think that's probably what John is, uh, what Nathaniel is saying here, because that seems to be one of the big debates. Because what Jesus is actually going to say later is he's going to say, you know, I'm not actually from Bethlehem or Nazareth or any. I'm from heaven. You know, that's going to be the thing of Jesus and where he's from. And one of the uh, one of the big ideas in the book of John is where is Jesus from? Jesus is from heaven. Um, and that's actually uh, a big idea that gets played on a lot. And I think that I think that Nathaniel is bringing this up for the first time to say, how can something that good have come from Nazareth? That's not where he's supposed to come from. You know, my thinking also is that Nazareth did not have a great reputation. It was not a great city. It was a very small city. Even uh, even in Galilee, it seems to be looked down upon by the uh, people in the other cities like Capernaum and uh, and uh, and some of those others where the Cana, they, they kind of looked down on Galilee uh, or on Nazareth. And so that accompanied with what uh, Brian just said. Also in John chapter seven, when Nicodemus speaks up and says, you know, we shouldn't be condemning a man without hearing him. They say, Are you from Galilee? Uh, search the scriptures. No prophet comes out of Galilee, but Isaiah 9 and verse 2, which Matthew had quoted, 
uh, does show that his ministry would begin in, 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 in Galilee. And Matthew points that out. Uh, and so that's probably already fairly common knowledge at this time among those who, uh, I, I say at this time, at the time that John is written, not at the time this discussion goes on. Uh, and so uh, John the Apostle doesn't need to go into that. Okay. Well, Brian, I'm, I'm going to throw this next one to you then. Um, with what you were talking about, and I may have blanked out for just a second with what you were saying and didn't listen to everything, but I really tried. Um, in regards to the explanation of uh, his statement, Nathaniel's statement, do you think verse 51 could be in kind of response to that idea, going back to where you said, Je you know, where Jesus truly is from? Absolutely. I think it's a neat comment. And uh, let me kind of add a little thought about that. I think that this is the fulfillment of the vision that Jacob had in the Old Testament, Jacob's ladder. Uh, Jacob envisioned the idea at Bethel, the idea of the place of God or the house of God, that there could be a connection between God and man. And he could see angels ascending and descending on that. We call it Jacob's ladder. Jesus, I think, is subtly saying he is the ladder. He's the thing that connects God and man, uh, uh, that that permits this passage between heaven and earth uh, for, for man and God. He's the connection between God and man. Um, otherwise, Jacob's ladder is kind of an ambiguous vision that really doesn't have a lot of sense. But this reference that Jesus makes, and a lot of Bibles, by the way, even will footnote Genesis chapter 28 here and kind of connect us back to say, hey, you know, maybe this is that. I think Jesus is saying that this is that. This is that vision and that image. And again, that Jesus is from heaven, he's God, he has come to earth, uh, you know, to man, and it's not about being from Nazareth, it's about being from heaven. So I do think there's a, a significant point there as well. Well, and I'll, I'll just add some thoughts on that My John disappeared. Um, so we're, I'm teaching the general epistles of John right now, and I, at least in my study, I see a connection in all of the Johnine corpus of, of of reaffirming the gospel truth of the divinity of Christ and, and, and incarnation, all that stuff, as a means to refute uh, the proto-Gnostics and people who are denying such a thing. And what's interesting to me is, again, these false teachers in the end of the first century were claiming special knowledge given to them by angels and so forth. And here John's emphasizing this this just Jacob's ladder and angels descending and ascending. Um, and it's kind of, to me, it's a little jab of like, you, you claim you have angelic mysteries and stuff, but no, actually Christ is the fulfillment of uh, of all these Old Testament types. And and you, you're claiming, you know, you, you have, I don't know if any of the groups claim Jacob's ladder, but wouldn't surprise me. And no, here you have the actual Jacob's ladder here in the incarnate Christ, in the embodied Christ here, so. So heaven there uh, would probably be uh, a roundabout way of saying communications are open. And I'm here, I'm getting and receiving from the angels, from God, through the angels. And, uh, and you're going to be seeing these miraculous things as well as a result. Well, and yeah, and that goes back to the prologue, um, you know, in 14... Uh, through 18, um, no one has 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him or declared Him. Uh, so, and and I think this is fulfilled in John 14. Jesus says, "I'm the way." You know, yeah. how are we going to get to the Father? I'm the way. I'm the ladder. You know, yeah. and so He's telling. And by the way, it's Nathaniel and Philip, and Philip is the guy that says, "Hey, how do we know the Father?" You know how. Uh, you know, they're, they're asking these questions. Jesus will say, I, I'm the way. I'm I'm the ladder. Uh, every blessing from heaven is going to come through me. But, you know, the angels, the, you know, that 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 bless us in our lives, you know, that, that are ministering spirits, uh, our communication to God that goes to heaven. Uh, Jesus is the way for all of that. I am the way. There's no other way but me. So, you know, when he's saying this vision, that's it's pretty neat. Oh, yeah. And and kind of dubbed out to that in first john 2 when he starts talking about the anointing and you know all things uh, john's reviewing the claim that oh you need a special anointing to know all these things like no you already have it you're in the priesthood of god you're a believer you already have all things in christ and so you this this reaffirming in john's gospel and the epistles and even revelation on the seven letters part 
of just this reaffirming of Christians, if you're in Christ, already have all these things. Christ is a fulfillment of all, you know, of Christ is the way to get all these things. And so you don't need to leave him for another gospel or, or, or some other false teaching. Okay. Good explanation. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Thanks for that says, uh, show us the Father. Phillips is up, yeah. Um, so I was able to hear the discussion, though, about the comparison like Jacob's Ladder, the dream there. That brought to mind, and I know that probably the context is a little bit different, of course, but in Romans chapter 10, beginning there in verse 6, where he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, I think it's 12 and 13, um, but he says there in the text there, but the righteousness of faith speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, again, the context is, is different, but it's still that idea of um, the, the avenue of communication we now have with God through Christ, the word being with us. There's no need to go and retrieve him. He's already come. The way is already there. The word is already there. So a little bit different context, but kind of brought that to memory there. Well, and this, I would say, brings up a practical point um, is, you know, every generation is going to deal with people claiming or people desiring something more, something mysterious, something more in depth, the hidden knowledge. When really the beauty of the Christian faith is it's simple. And it's yeah. it's for our benefit, and the truth has not changed um, at all. And the challenge and the blessing uh, is we just have to pay dogged attention to those familiar truths. And the more we pay attention to those things, the more we're going to grow. Um, it's amazing to me in John's general epistles that he doesn't refute Gnosticism by examining their doctrine. He refutes it by going back to the fundamental teachings of the gospel. Christ gave up heaven, was embodied, died, was resurrected. That Those are the core gospel facts that John just keeps reaffirming over and over again. And even here in this gospel, the big point is, as said in chapter 20, that Jesus is the Christ. And by, by, yeah. by acknowledging that and believing that, you may have life. Uh, he doesn't go into a long dissertation. It's reaffirming these these familiar truths. I like to think yeah. it, the truth is hidden in plain sight. I mean, yeah. Paul, uh, Paul, I think, in Second Corinthians chapter 4, uh, hidden in Christ. The truth is hidden in Christ. And so when we look at the text and dig into the text, uh, we see the truth. It is hidden, but it's in plain sight. It's there for for us to, to dig up and and, uh, and and unearth as far as ourselves are concerned. It's it's not That's good point. that good point. Well, that brings us to the end of our chapter. So Tom is set quietly, a little bit under the weather with a cold. Tom, you have any final thoughts before we uh, pull it to a close? I think you all have done an excellent job covering this text, so I didn't need to add anything. Appreciate the affirmation. We always need that. Um, <laughs> Paul, any thoughts from you? No, sir. Uh, good study today. Sorry I had to step away for a while, but uh, glad to be uh, back and able to be a part of uh, Truth Factor. Okay. Well, I appreciate you joining us again. He's, he's been like, I don't want to go. And then finally, four weeks into the study, all right, I'll be there. You've had a lot going on in your life, a whole Here's lot. Happened. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a whole lot. Um, any other thoughts from Brian, uh, Bob, or Brendan? Okay. All right, I so listen. It, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was a real good study. <laughs> well, it, it was. I really I really appreciate that. We do have, um, so Arthel Bass, he is one of our elders here at Seminole Point. He has uh, dropped a comment into the study. And we'll go ahead and bring it in real quick. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked, but he was told to come and see. Many times you cannot reason with a person, but only tell them to come and see. Good point. Very, very Anyways, good point. And that's what Jesus said to the two disciples. Yeah. 
Uh, we Good point. Good point. All righty. Well, listen, if you uh, have a question or comment that comes up during the course of the week, maybe something you want to ask us about, you can send those to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually, as you see on the screens there. Uh, we'll be definitely happy to receive your thoughts, comments, questions. If it's something that we can tackle, then we will do our best to do so. Um, remember to like and subscribe on the YouTube side of things to like and follow on the Facebook side of things. So that way you'll get a notification when we are back here again next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, continuing through our study of the Gospel of John. We'll pick up with John chapter 2, verse 1. All righty. Well, I guess that's it. Everyone, we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Keep studying your Bible and serve the Lord. Bye-bye. Okay.